Hello and welcome to the podcast in the words of Vasit. Today I'm joined by a uh, computer astrophysicist. Uh, he was also part of Forbes 30 of 30 uh, to scientist this in 2021, Mr. Carl uh, E. Fields. Welcome to the show, Carl. Thank you for having me. I'm excited uh, so, to be here. So can you give you your introduction for our listeners? Yeah, so uh, my name is Carl Fields. I'm a PhD candidate at Michigan State University, jointly uh, supported by uh, the National Science Foundation and Los Alamos National Lab. I'm currently a visiting grad student at Arizona State University, where I've been working remotely, finishing up the last year of my PhD, um, finishing up some research and applying for postdoctoral positions right now. Um, I work on massive stars and uh, core, coll core collapse supernova explosions, so the explosion of massive stars, uh, something I've really been interested in lately. And I use computer simulations of these models and of these stars to kind of get a better understanding of the role that they play and the general evolution of the galaxy and the universe as a whole. Okay, great. So how, so can you explain your uh, work uh, more uh, further that how does supercomputers measure supernovas in those collect, uh, collisions and how does supercomputer help uh, to uh, simulate them? Yeah, so um, a lot of these simulations rely on some, uh, some very complicated set of equations so the equation of the equations of hydrodynamics that sort of uh, dictate how the properties of fluids sort of uh, behave under different conditions. And these equations are very computationally challenging to solve sometimes. And they actually become more computationally challenging depending on um, the number of dimensions that you include. And so by the number of dimensions, I mean um, you can do things in one dimension. So you have something that goes um, along a straight line, for instance, or you could do something in 2D where you can go in the X direction or in the Y direction, so pretty much up or down or left or right. But when you include full 3D, so X, Y, Z direction, um, that's when they become very computationally expensive and they're hard to model, and that's what requires the computational resources of some of the supercomputers at the na national labs, uh, for instance, as uh, like at Argonne National Lab, which is where we're running some simulations right now. Um, and so those are some of the only places that have the resources necessary to allow us to run these simulations in 3D. And the reason we need to run these in 3D is because a lot of the phenomena that help facilitate successful explosion in these simulations is inherently 3D. And when you're in 1D or 2D, reduced dimensions, um, these phenomena and sort of these sort of sloshing, um, nonlinear behavior they, they, don't, uh, they don't show up uh, in 1D or 2D. And so that's sort of the need for 3D simulations. And that's what sort of uh, requires us to use sort of the state of the art in terms of supercomputers and computational resources. So how powerful are these supercomputers? Yeah, so um, right now we're sort of on the, um, the verge of what's called this era of exascale computing. And so that are that sort of describes computers that the combined um, have the combined compute uh, potential of an exaflop, and so it's a this is sort of the um, floating point operation per second. So this is sort of a measure of how many operations a um, machine can do within within a within a second. And so this is sort of the way in which we can quantify how powerful a machine is. And so I believe that Summit at um, Oak Ridge National Lab, but I don't want to quote specific numbers because I'm not too familiar with the machine, but I do know that um, a lot of the algorithms we're working on, um, some of the new ways that we're sort of refactoring our code is aimed towards this next generation of exascale computing. And so that's, that's something we're focusing on. Um, and so for, for instance, the machine that I use right now um, has something on the order of a couple hundred thousand cores. Um, that's that's what we use with our simulations. That's sort of the running um, amount of resources that we use each time you run these very large 3D simulations. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, talking about astronomy, there was a great event. It's still going on this week. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn were visible. So how great was it? Yeah, so I actually saw that um, going around on Twitter. So um, I actually wasn't able to see it myself. And so I, you know, I, I haven't been following a lot of, I guess, some of the observational astronomy trends that we see. So I know that there's sometimes we'll see meteor showers and stuff. I know um, in the Midwest, so this is more of an atmospheric effect, but still a cool one in my opinion that uh, Aurora Borealis, this is something I used to be able, or to hear that we used to be able to see um, in, in Michigan when I lived there. But 
Um, I wasn't able to actually see it for myself, but I did see some um, some pictures on Twitter that it looks pretty awesome. And so it's great when you can, because I feel like those events are a great ways to get the the community at large sort of engaged into astronomy and something something as simple as this uh, event when people are aware of it can really get someone interested in astronomy at a young age and um, you know set them on that path to pursuing it as a career. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's great. Astronomy is one of my favorite subjects. So how was uh, how was did you feel when you were part uh, you were made part of Forbes 30 out of 30 days? It was really awesome. You know, I so. I think a couple months back, I had been notified that I was nominated. And I remember when I got the email, I was actually kind of confused. And I, I think it went to my spam folder. So I was like, okay, this link, is this link safe, you know? And, and so I court, sort of vetted it out a bit and, um, you know, verified that the person sending it was um, connected to, the, to, to Forbes. And so I, I submitted the information and it actually worked out because I had applied for something else, which was somewhat of a similar sort of uh, well, so I didn't apply for the Forbes, but I applied to something that was a similar public speaking sort of fellowship. Um, and so I actually had all these answers prepared about, you know, what does my research mean to those at large and, and so on. And so I was able to use those answers, refactor them into the way that I thought would make me successful in the Forbes. Um, and then I got that email, you know, on December 1st that I had been accepted. And it was honestly, I'm still sort of <laughs> uh, getting used to being named it, you know, because it's still very shocking to me. But it's it's so awesome, especially when I see the other people on those lists, people that are my peers and, you know, people that I look up to and whose work I admire, admire um, in terms of science communication and outreach, uh, it's, really be, it's really been awesome to be uh, named alongside them. And I'm excited to see what this does for me in the future. Uh, what are your future plans? Do you have any after completing your PhD and what field are you going to continue and what are your ambitions and dreams? Yeah, so um, right now I'm applying for postdoctoral fellowship positions. Um, I plan to continue doing the research I'm doing, sort of building on it, um, extending into different areas that I've yet to um, extend into. Um, and so that's kind of my short term goals. You know, I'm apply I've applied to, I think, 10 or 11 postdoctoral fellowships. Um, I've had one or two interviews, I actually have an interview next week. So I'm starting to hear back from these positions. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping something lands there and then I'll take up my, you know, a postdoctoral position. Um, starting next fall, hopefully, um, after I finish my PhD, which I plan to defend this coming semester, so in um, April or so. Um, and then beyond that, you know, I want to continue on this academic track. I want to get more engaged in scientific outreach and, um, you know, build on these research efforts. Um, and then the goal is to hopefully find a faculty position and um, find a university that I feel comfortable with so I can sort of build a research group and um, keep towards these efforts. Okay, so let's talk about uh, more about astronomy and what what do you think? I think uh, that's a lot of people's question that when uh, uh, humans are going to be sent to Mars and that there's we if we have heard that it might be in the 2030s or 40s that NASA might send humans to Mars. So where do you think that will happen? Um, I have not too much about the matter. I do think that you know space space exploration is is very important. I think that's something that we should sort of be considering. Something that I've thought a little bit more about, um, and I've been trying to educate myself and learn about what the other scholars that that do work on the the scholars that do work on this how, how they feel about it. Um, you know, what is what do sort of space exploration, um, and particularly visiting Mars? What does that look like, right? Um, and so that's something I'm interested in you know what 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 are ways in which we can visit mars and learn about it and explore it in a way that's um ethical and something that that isn't um causing any sort of destructive you know i mean there there's this sort of um idea of you know nasa has their own um standards in terms of how clean the spacecraft can be and so on but then there's also these other like um questions of like well do we leave something there do we build do we build sort of um a base there I don't even know what to call it, but um, those are some of the questions that I think I've been more concerned with. Um, I do think the efforts that are going on in terms of getting people sent to Mars is really awesome. Um, but I think 2030, maybe even 2035 might be a bit optimistic. I think it might be later than that. Yeah, it might be. And as for the space exploration uh, search for life in uh, continues in universe, so do you think that what do you think we are most likely to find life in our solar system? Is it going to be Europa? 
uh, Europe, a Titan, or any other moon, or a, on any other planet, we can find a life? That's a good question. So um, I think that uh, I think it's sort of a hard question to answer because I think that there are many ways, and you know, there are people that there are astrobiologists that work on this specific question as their career. Uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to define what we mean by life. You know, um, you could have organic life forms, you could have intelligent life, and so on. And so that sort of muddies up what the answer might be. But I do think that it's very possible that we might see some sort of, um, you know, components that's that support sort of uh, life as we know it on Earth, right? So whether it's 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 water beneath sort of the oceans of some of these ice moons and stuff. I think that's something that's really possible and i'm glad that there's people really um, working on this and are interested in that question i just don't know in my own personal opinion and this is not really like i said i'm not an expert on this i don't know if that sort of um directly sort of leads to there being life there although i am excited in, in the event that we do find sort of these components um you know water and, and so on that facilitate life life on earth so yeah it's a yeah, another question that might be easy for you what's your favorite uh, planet and solar system? You know, I really like Pluto. It's something about the, the battle between being named a planet and um, a dwarf planet, which I guess is the is what it is now. Um, but I think I think Pluto is great, especially seeing, you know, when I was younger, some of the, the very pixelated images we had of Pluto and some of the high res resolution images we have now. Um, are pretty great. I think um, maybe a second is uh, Jupiter, but I think they're both great. It's lovely to hear. But Pluto is also my favorite planet. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, so we great. might run a campaign in future to include by, so, uh, Pluto back in our solar system and count it yeah. as a planet instead of dark, dark planet. Yeah. Maybe it'll get back in there someday. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can work together for Pluto. Yeah, and uh, as talking about uh, more about, can you explain more about supernovas and how do they happen? And uh, since your work is more related to the these supernovas. Yeah, so um, there, there are actually a couple classes. Well, there are more, there are a lot of classes of supernovae, but um, I, I, I guess I would say that there's two main categories, maybe three, if you're getting into the details. Um, the one that I focus on is the ones that are facilitated by gravitational collapse and sort of um, implosion, I guess. Um, so once a massive star sort of builds uh, a sufficiently heavy core uh, inside the star made out of iron, um, the pressure from that core can no longer support itself. So it starts to collapse, falls inwards, creates a shock or a pressure wave that moves outwards. And that pressure wave can sometimes be energetic enough if it's, um, if its energy is sort of increased by the neutrinos, um, these small energetic particles coming out of the core to help drive that shock and explode the star and sort of unbind the stellar envelope. So these are the, the supernovae that I work on. Um, you can also have a scenario where uh, a more low mass star, um, it sort of ejects all of the envelope off and just leaves behind that core that I've talk talked about, but that core is made up of carbon and oxygen. And there's a maximum mass that that core can have. And so if you have, say, a binary companion um, that can, you know, transfer matter onto this core and push it beyond that mass, you can have ignition through more of a, um, what's called like a, like a flame, like typical combustion that we're familiar with. So that's called a um, thermonuclear uh, supernova. So that's a different class of supernova that I don't work on, but it's something I'm still interested in because, um, both of these sort of contribute to the way that elements are produced in different galaxies and throughout our universe. Um, I'm particularly interested in the type of supernovae that I work on, so the massive star supernovae. I'm particularly interested in those because um, there's a lot of questions in terms of um, the hydrodynamic behavior, so how these, you know, what this shock or this pressure wave sort of looks like, and can we quantify what this um, tells us about the the initial star before it explodes because a lot of times when we observe explosions we sort of see the aftermath and so when we see the aftermath of that we want to work with observers and work backwards and see if we can make predictions of what that star possibly looked like you know what initial mass it had what was the initial composition because then that can give us more uh, information about sort of star generation and the 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 uh 
the generations of stars and different types of elements that they produce uh, in sort of a broader context other than just looking at the explosion. So that's, that's something I'm really interested on. Yeah, it's uh, great to hear. So what are, uh, do you think, how great is future for uh, future ahead of us in terms of astronomy and our research and knowing more about our universe? I think it's very bright. Um, I think there's a lot of things that um, that are going to be happening. So we have JWST that's going to be going online, I guess, sometime soon. Um, I'm not super connected to it, but I hear about it. Um, it's been pushed back, pushed back, but I, I know it's getting close. Um, and so that's something that people in observational astronomy are really excited about. Um, we're really excited in terms of my subfield in, in this idea of multi-messenger astronomy. And so with the LIGO gravitational wave detector online um, and sort of improvements being made to that with advanced LIGO and sort of future generation of detectors. We have Super Kamiokande is a, is a neutrino detector. Um, all of these things are ways in which we can get more information about the explosions of massive stars that can be then coupled to the simulations that I'm running. And so we're kind of sort of getting to this point where we're kind of at pace with observation and the simulations. So that's something that I'm really excited about is being able to connect these two to you know, predict and sort of um, get greater detail into simulations that we weren't otherwise possible, able to do you know, 10 years ago. And so that's something that I'm excited about moving forward. Yeah, it just looks really bright. And there's also a manned mission uh, on the moon is coming soon by NASA in 2024. So what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so I haven't been following it closely. I do know that NASA did pick a new class of astronauts, I, I believe um, was the case. I think I, I saw the list, excuse me, on my, on my Twitter. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think that's really great. I think that, again, I think that sort of space exploration is, is something that's really a key component in inspiring the next generation. There's also a lot of science that's done with these missions and stuff. And so hearing about this, although I'm pretty um, sort of my work is pretty far away from that. It's still connected to so, a lot of the efforts that, that NASA has, and these all play a role with each other. And so that's something I'm really excited about and to follow and um, to see how that uh, goes forward in, in, in that year. I'm not sure this was, you said 2024, but that sounds, it sounds really close and it sounds exciting, so. Yeah, before we end our uh, podcast, do you have any message for people interested in astronomy and, and people who might, kids and, uh, uh, children who might be interested in astronomy and why do they why do we need to follow the astronomy and uh, develop the interest in it yeah i think it's a good question um so i think that uh you know if you're interested in astronomy i think that there are a lot of ways that um you can get involved and i think that you know from the people that i've talked to people have reached out to me some of the things that i hear is that you know there there's you know, I, I'm really interested in astronomy, but I'm doing this thing and I don't see how it's interested or, or something like that, or, or how, it's in, um, how it's tied in, how it's involved. Uh, there are a lot of ways I think that other degrees or other interests can sort of tie back into astronomy. And so I think anywhere from engineering, computer science, um, geology, these can all kind of tie into astronomy in some way. And so I think that, um, I think if you do have an interest in astronomy, um, you know, for instance, for people in college that are trying to get into it, but are a different degree, you know, try to look around at your university, see who's working on what, see if they're, they're taking students, you know, see, see what connections you can make to astronomy to help you gauge that interest and see if it's something you potentially wanted to pursue in grad school. Um, you know, if you're in high school now or, um, you know, K-12, um, you know, get involved with sort of the local resources that connect um, you know, any astronomy outreach efforts, either through a local university, community college, or something like that. Um, I think there are a lot of ways to get connected to astronomy and sort of getting your foot in that door, understanding what opportunities are out there, um, are sort of that first step in getting you uh, to see if that's something you want to pursue as a career, because I think that there's a lot of um, career pathways for astronomy um, that are possible. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Carl, for giving you all the important time and coming on my show. It means a lot. Uh, it means a lot for me that you came on my show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it was really great. It was great to talk with you. Um, and, and thanks again for having me. Okay. Have a great day, Carl. You too. Thank you.